So my original abstract reads as follows, right? Um, I argue that a proper understanding of Aldo Leopold's land ethic necessitates affirming three largely unrecognized propositions. First, Leopold identifies health as a sufficient condition for moral standing. Um, this has implications not only for ecosystems, but for individual organisms as well. Second, uh, Leopold sets the value of health alongside other privileged values, which makes him a robust moral pluralist. Lastly, in order to negotiate competing values brought about by such pluralism, Leopold embraces a consistency maximization of values. In putting forward these ideas, I compare their reasonableness to those interpretive elements of Leopold's most well-known articulator and defender, J. Baird Calicott. Um, what emerges from my argument is a new, um, I think, more fitting understanding of Leopold's land ethic. Um, and so that's what I had sent to uh, Ellie. And um, I realized as I was putting material together that maybe all that was too ambitious to do within 45 minutes. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, my original invitation, and I, I thank you so much for it. Um, it's, it's nice to be here with you. Um, I, yeah, I should say I'm looking a bit feral now that I can see my, I, um, I haven't had a haircut in a year. I, uh, here in Texas, we, um, we had bad snow and ice storms and the state wasn't prepared for it. So I went like a week without shaving and I'm just like, okay, let's see how this goes. And I've grown a white beard and I'm still in my forties and I'm perplexed as to why I have a white beard. Um, it seems like I should be welcoming people to Jurassic Park or saving hobbits from some horrible fate. But, um, you know, uh, I'm staring at myself and every day I look a little different. But aside from being feral, um, yeah, my uh, approach here today is to um, use my criticisms of Calicut as a springboard toward those propositional elements that I spoke of. Whether I'll get to them all, um, I don't know. So um, I may have promised more than I can deliver on, at least uh, within this session. Um, the interesting thing though is it represents um, my next project um, for publication is putting forward a positive account of my understanding of Leopold, which I think is fairly novel. Um, and I hope it interests you um, and uh, getting feedback, getting challenged is most welcome. So with that, um, the way I'll proceed is, is rather old school. Um, I will read from uh, my prepared arguments, but I will also break away from them to speak somewhat extemporaneously, um, to add some things that I've thought of uh, more recently. So um, with that, let me dive right in here. Uh, another prefatory remark is that another aspect of the scholarship that I do um, has to do with the idea of moral progress. And um, I studied under Donald Shearer at Bowling Green State University, and Don was one of the, um, like, Jay, uh, like Calicott, was one of the first voices in environmental ethics. I think he put together the first anthology. And he himself is a Leopoldian. Um, so I've certainly been influenced by Don's interpretation, but I think I've, um, fleshed out some things um, that certainly go beyond what, what he would argue. Um, and the other thing that made my approach unique when we were working together on my dissertation was that I wanted to bring the idea of moral progress into an understanding of Leopold because at the outset of the land ethic essay, um, Leopold pretty much is inviting us to make moral progress. Um, 
And here's what he says. And I know this will sound familiar to many of you because you know, many of you are familiar with um, Leopold's work and specifically a San County Almanac and more specifically the land ethic. So I begin uh, with this in the seminal essay, The Land Ethic, the father of conservation biology, Aldo Leopold, briefly discusses the evolution of morality. Leopold observes that human morality has evolved through a gradual extension of ethical concern to both previously ignored modes of conduct and persons theretofore unconsidered. He then famously suggests that the next step in human moral development is for persons to extend moral consideration to the land. In 1948, when Leopold is penning this essay, um, it was published posthumously a year later after his um, unfortunate unti untimely death. Um, when he's pinning this essay in 48, he maintains that, quote, there is as of yet no ethic dealing with man's relation to land and to the animals and plants which grow upon it, end quote. Of course, he does not deny that there have been moral figures in the past who have advocated such an ethic. It was simply the case that he had yet to observe society actually being guided by a true, what we would dub an environmental ethic, an ethic that affirms what he considers to be the real moral weightiness of non-human nature. For Leopold, um, he reasoned that an environmental ethic reflecting the burdens of such weight would be substantially guided by something like his off-sided normative principle, quote, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community, it is wrong when it tends otherwise, end quote. Um, I argue that a proper understanding of Leopold's land ethic, um, and this goes back to uh, the propositions that I spoke of before, and I won't re-articulate those. Um, and as I said, what I wanna do ultimately is use Calicott's uh, interpretations as a springboard just because he is the most well-known uh, defender and systematizer of Leopold. And um, his interpretations arguably have gone through stages um, up to and including his new uh, earth ethic um, that he published um, in book form uh, not, not that long ago. Okay. So it's in part four of a Stan County Almanac that Leopold formally starts to lay out his land ethic. And here's where he um, gets at the idea that moral progress needs to be made by us humans. Leopold sets up his discussion with musings about the Homeric character Odysseus and how upon his return from Troy, the epic figure hung his slave girls for suspected misbehavior. Leopold implies that if Odysseus or any of his contemporaries would have questioned the rightness of this action, given their moral milieu, they would likely have been charged with making a category mistake. That is, they would be charged with wrongly placing slaves in the category of morally considerable entities. Um, they would do so instead of that category's opposite, disposable property. After all, Odysseus's culture acknowledged these women to be his property. And expediency was in the Greece of Odysseus's day and is in Leopold's United States and beyond the norm that ranges over the disposal of property. When fast forwarding 3000 years to the time Leopold writes his essay, he states that one cannot help but notice the occurrence of a moral progression over that time. Ethical criteria, Leopold observes, um, now have come to range over more human activities than in Odysseus's era, with those activities judged solely by expediency having, corresponding, having corresponding, correspondingly shrunk. Um, indeed, Leopold thinks that it's possible to outline the evolution of some of this progress. For example, he claims that the first, the first ethics codified by humans concerned how individuals ought interpersonally to treat one another. The 10 commandments he suggests were an example of this. Hereafter were added norms regarding an individual's relationship with society, Leopold explaining that the golden rule 
is an attempt at integrating the individual to society while democracy tries to reconcile social organization to the individual. What has not been instituted as of yet, he reasons, is an ethic that governs the relations of humans to the land and to the organisms that grow on it. Um, one of the uh, pieces on moral progress that I find most convincing is put forward by Michelle Moody Adams. And she wrote this, uh, an article entitled The Idea of Moral Progress back in the early 2000s. And she says that anytime someone approaches the idea of moral progress, they're doing so um, in a couple different ways. They are arguing that there should be either moral progress in belief and or moral progress in practice. Um, what's of further interest about her account is she thinks that there, there's, a, there's a finite set of values that we humans can use to intelligibly discuss what morality means. So she privileges um, the values of compassion, righteousness, by which I think she is getting at the notion of virtue, um, compassion, righteousness, and justice. And so when we make moral progress in terms of our beliefs, we are mining the semantic depth of those moral concepts and then taking the next step um, of putting into practice those better understandings. And when I sort of view Leopold through that lens or, um, or those lenses, um, he's very much burdening himself with both explaining why moral progress should be made in belief, but also how that belief should translate into practice. And um, it's a fascinating question whether what he's offering up is a wholly new value, which Moody Adams thinks um, should be unintelligible to us. We would um, reject it because uh, it doesn't fit within, um, or at least many people perhaps would say it doesn't fit within that scheme of compassion, righteousness, and justice, um, especially given the entities involved um, and the idea of systems being involved. But certainly that's what Leopold himself is arguing for. So extending ethics for Leopold, he thought um, is both, and here I'm quoting here a snippet, an evolutionary possibility and an ecological necessity. To change the hearts and minds of folks, Leopold very much wants to stress the relationship between ecology and ethics. For not only is it the taking up of the ecological point of view that helps affirm the reasonableness of his land ethic, but he thinks that the very process of extending ethics to hitherto unregulated forms of conduct is a process in ecological evolution. Um, that is, Leopold implies that this is a process where improved social interactions between entities betters their survival conditions. The stages of this evolution, Leopold maintains, can be described in both ecological and philosophical terms. And um, he explains this idea of writing, quote, an ethic ecologically is a limitation on freedom of action in the struggle for existence. An ethic philosophically is a differentiation of social from antisocial conduct. These are two definitions of one thing. The thing has its origin in the, tenden in the tendency of interdependent individuals or groups to evolve modes of cooperation. The ecologist calls these symbioses. Um, politics and economics are advanced symbioses in which the original free-for-all competition has been replaced in part by cooperative mechanisms with an ethical content. Um, let me just highlight that last sentence that politics and economics are advanced symbioses in which um, the original free-for-all competition has been replaced in part by cooperative mechanisms with an ethical content. Um, Callicott, in his interpretations of Leopold, 
wants to set aside instances where Leopold talks about expediency or something along the lines of utility, um, human-centered reasons for embracing a land ethic as sufficient for justifying a land ethic. Um, Callicott goes on to say, well, there's a couple ways of viewing ethics. Um, and he, he makes this distinction that we'll get to later on, uh, but he doesn't want to um, admit that economics and, and politics um, have the kind of ethical content that Leopold alludes to here. Okay, so the very way, the very way Leopold goes on uh, to define ethics reveals his commitment to a naturalized account of their emergence. In essence, Leopold thinks that humans have evolved into interdependent individuals or groups that display a tendency to formulate mechanisms for cooperation, among these mechanisms being ethics. Those ethical me mechanisms can then be explained philosophically as providing for social ways of acting as differentiated from antisocial ways, while an ecological explanation of those same mechanisms has them being described as limitations placed on freedom of action in the fight for survival. Um, explaining uh, further the nature of ethics, Leopold borrows from both the philosophical and ecological ways of speaking about them and writes, all ethics so far, um, all ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. His instincts prompt him to compete for his place in the community, but his ethics prompt him also to cooperate, perhaps in order that there be a place to compete for. Um, and the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. Now, um, Leopold wasn't himself a philosopher, as many of you know. Um, he was a forester. Uh, he was appointed uh, later on as professor of game management there at um, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, but he, of course, was a very well-educated man, got his degree in forestry from Yale, um, was well-read on his own, and perhaps the most important education he got was that which was provided by his um, duties as a forester. He would um, be very attentive to what the land was essentially teaching him. And I think that his series of essays in Sand County Almanac is um, communicating um, to a wide audience uh, what he had learned. Um, from his observations of the land. Okay. And so, but for us philosophers, what, what we want to know, our key question is, what is the conceptual impetus that prompts we humans to enlarge the boundaries of our moral community, to expand the subset of things containing that which is morally considerable? Um, basically, why should we broaden our notion of the set of morally considerable things to include that which Leopold wants us to include? So I write, to begin formulating an answer from what Leopold provides textually, it's noteworthy that he claims that no significant change in ethics has ever been made without persons altering their intellectual emphasis loyalties, affections, and convictions. Leopold further points out that broadening the notion of community was not something the conservation movement of his day was emphasizing. And this I find important. This is evidenced, he surmises, by the absence of conservation talk in both philosophy and religion circles. So I think anyone approaching Leopold's um, land ethic essay, not only is it rather apparent that he wants to communicate his ideas to a rather broad audience, but he wants persons in various disciplines or areas of thought to start discoursing about 
um, a land ethic within certain contexts. So philosophers need to start talking about this and religionists need to start talking about this. And, and were I Calicut early on, I would have kept in mind that the most likely interpretation to give of Leopold would be one where philosophers and practitioners of religion could engage with Leopold's ideas. And um, in uh, Calicut's essay, A Triangular Affair, um, he puts out such a radical interpretation of Leopold that it seems to preclude acceptance by the philosophical community. And um, certainly I would think uh, practitioners of, of various religions, just as, as an aside there. So I write the land ethic essay and other supportive ethical ideas found in a sand county almanac. After all, the land ethic essay is couched um, between other essays. It's reasonable to think um, that he is putting forward ideas capable of persuading both, as I was saying, the philosopher and the religionist that a broadened notion of community is justified. Um, Leopold's strategy thus appears to be sensitizing a diverse readership to the values that biotic holes embody and then uh, to demonstrate how recognizing such values necessitates a change in our ethical behavior, a rather significant change, okay? Um, so those are my remarks about Leopold himself. And um, looking at the time, I, I realize it's uh, ticking away, but um, let's briefly talk here about Calicott's early interpretation of Leopold. I kind of understand why Calicott gave an interpretation of Leopold's land ethic principle as being sort of the supreme moral principle at the end of the day, right? And early on, he even, as you probably know, um, invokes the ideas of Plato to justify how you could sacrifice individual constituents of systems, including humans, for the well being the larger biotic community. After all, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. What do moral principles do for we philosophers? Um, they usually communicate a theory of value that the, the principle harkens to notions of what's good, um, what's right. Um, and as far as unpacking the right thing to do. The principle is communicating a decision procedure. Um, how do we decide based upon what's of value or what defines what's right, how to act? And so if front and center is the principle and, it's, uh, and yet you sort of lose sight of maybe some other things Leopold had written um, in his other essay, you might come up with an interpretation that was labeled uh, as fascistic, for example, by uh, Tom Reagan, right? Um, the great animal rights theorist. To be fair to Calicott, he is no longer allowing his triangular affair essay to be published in anthologies. Um, if you go to his website, I think he, he makes a remark that he did let, I believe it was um, a foreign, uh, sorry, a non-English uh, anthology to include his essay, but that was it because he, know, he doesn't want his essay to be seen as adversarial to animal rights and animal liberation ethics, right? Um, but I think it's fascinating to see the evolution of Calicut's thinking. Um, and so that's why I still address it. So Calicut begins his uh, triangular affair essay by proposing that Leopold's land ethic is paradigmatic for what an environmental ethic amounts to, citing especially Leopold's efforts to extend direct moral considerability from people to non-human natural entities. Leopold urges that non-human nature is not simply a bundle of resources to be used instrumentally. Calicut implies that ultimately a land ethic identifies the 
locus of supreme moral value as residing within biotic holes. Um, that is to say ecosystems, um, maybe the biosphere, and not within any type of individual organism, human or otherwise, right? Calicott explains that one implication of interpreting Leopold's land ethic this way is that it allows for differentiating, <clears throat> pardon me, between environmental ethics on the one hand and animal rights, animal liberation movements on the other. Um, in fact, Calicott goes ahead and labels animal ethics as humane moralism. So the seemingly, re seemingly related intellectual trend of assigning intrinsic value to animals is actually, Calicott thinks, part of a moral worldview that is as distinct from an environmental ethic as humane moralism is from an anthropocentric ethic. That is just as um, a human-centered ethic uh, underwrites the moral permissibility of sacrificing some non-human animals to the desires and interests of humans, separating anthropocentric ethics from the animal respecting upshot of humane moralism, so too does the holism characteristic of like the Leopoldian environmental ethic, the trust notion that the needs of animals may be sacrificed for the good of say ecosystems, thus separating humane moralism from an environmental ethic. Emphasizing the schism between humane moralists and, envir and environmental ethicists is just one controversial aspect of Calicott's article. Indeed, it's an aspect uh, whose efficacy, as Louis po uh, Poiman pointed out, played an important historic role in separating animal rights from environmentalism. And again, Calicott laments that and doesn't want this piece, you know, um, I guess by virtue of not being published, not being read. So Calicott's trichotomizing of environmental ethics, humane moralism and anthropocentric ethics was motivated again by a particular interpretation of Leopold and is, at the outset here, given Calicott's early interpretation of Leopold, that I wish to begin distinguishing my own efforts at understanding Leopold. So Calicott early on is embracing exclusively a holistic worldview. That's how he's interpreting Leopold. And it's a perspective uh, that Calicott thinks is nurtured and made reasonable by the science of ecology, remarking on how ecology provides this new perspective, he writes, quote, ecology focuses upon the relationship between and among things. And prior to ecology's emergence as a science, the landscape appeared to be a collection of objects, some of them alive, some conscious, but all the same, um, an aggregate, a plurality of separate individuals. Here is the appearance by my dog, Sherlock. He is saying hello, and I hopefully he will be cool for a bit more. Calicott thinks uh, it understandable that the earlier atomistic perspective um, yielded the notion that morality involves adjudicating between the rights and interests of individuals. Yet ecology's ability to unify these atoms into a much larger whole, analogous to the second order holes wrought, for example, by cells making up plant and animal bodies, it changes things. Um, it changes things morally as a third order whole is made intelligible. Now, Calicott makes clear that Leopold himself sometimes characterized this emerged third order entity as an organic being. Leopold says that, you know, um, these systems are very much like an organism. Other times, Leopold identifies this emerged entity as a community. That is, Leopold thinks that something very much like a community also arises given the economic dependencies between various organisms that make up a biotic whole. Such dependencies yielding unique characteristics attributable only to an emerged system, a community of sorts. When Calicott writes his next essay, interpreting Leopold, the conceptual foundations of the land ethic, he is going to privilege the community metaphor and argue that, and I think this is more of a rhetorical move, that the organism analogy that Leopold also uses was only vestigially present in his work. 
that you had ecology itself in between metaphors at the time Leopold was writing. And I guess Leopold, what he, he says, well, I mean, what would his train of thought be? Uh, all right, some people say ecosystems are organism-like, some people say it's, you know, they're community-like, therefore I'm just gonna use them interchangeably. But if he was comfortable doing so, and this is one of my criticisms of Calicott, there would have to be something that makes them both apt. And what I see as their common tie, and this is um, also based on numerous comments Leopold makes about what's important to organisms and communities sort of in themselves is health. Leopold will actually say that that's what conservation is. It's a concern for the health of the land. And so if he's going to use the organism analogy, if he's going to use the community analogy, why would he feel comfortable doing so? Just because different folks are using, you know, different analogies or, or metaphors. And so he'll just do it later on in an essay that um, he pens after the land ethic, uh, his wilderness essay, He's still using the organism analogy. So it's not just vestigially present. Now, Calicott in his uh, book, The Earth Ethic, um, or where he yeah, puts forward an earth ethic, he's going to go back to the organism analogy and now say that Leopold was presaging the idea that multiple metaphors would end up, be used, be, would end up being used um, by scientists. Right, and so I guess Leopold was able to discern that in 70 some odd years, people would still be doing that. Um, and then, you know, uh, Calicott goes on to flirt with, if not embrace, uh, a kind of Gaia hypothesis to put forward his earth ethic. And so here I'm starting to get at, you know, one of those propositions that I think is important regarding Leopold that it, it is health that is of value that ultimately, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself here because we're not, or I haven't yet launched into Calicott's later take on Leopold in um, Conceptual Foundations, but it's not because, so oh, sorry, um, the later take on Leopold ties Leopold's ideas to a Darwinian um, moral sense idea of ethics that um, the fascism charge levied at his early interpretation was wrongheaded because what we really need to do is pay attention to several pregnant quotations um, Leopold uses hearkening to um, Darwinian ethics and that Darwin had been sufficiently influenced by the likes of David Hume and Adam Smith, um, that, ethics race, uh, that ethics rests upon our emotions. And these emotions have been selected for biologically. And the, the idea of community and extending ethics to a community, to ecosystems, is made intelligible because communities help us maximize our genetic replication. Sorry, I know I'm packing a lot in, but I see that my time is, is kind of um, running short. Um, so quite simply, it's not because ecosystems are sufficiently like a community that we need to pay attention to their health, it's because communities have a health that we should pay attention to their well being, right? I think that Calicott gets it a bit, it's a bit skewed um, in his thinking. Um, and I'll be happy to answer questions about that because, again, I know I just sort of laid a bunch uh, on folks there, and I hope. Um, uh, I, I, I did so in an intelligible way. It's the supposed supremacy of the moral value that humans can perceive within biotic holes 
that very much distinguishes Calicott's earliest interpretations of Leopold's Landa. Calicott even draws from the history of philosophy, as I mentioned before, to demonstrate that highlighting a whole's moral supremacy is not novel. Calicott turns to none other than Plato and his idea that body, Plato's idea, that body, soul, and society have similar structures and corresponding virtues. The goodness of each is a function of its structure or organization and the relative value of its parts or contribution made to the integrity, stability, and beauty of each whole. So Plato, in the interest of those wholes represented by body, soul, or community, thinks it's appropriate to sometimes sacrifice their constituent parts in order to preserve the various virtues of these wholes, right? You can sacrifice the well-being of the citizenry um, for the polis, right? Um, for the state. You can um, tell noble lies that will have people assume particular vocations and take on certain understandings of themselves when he knows, sorry, this has to do with the myth of metals, um, when he knows that's not exactly right, but the, you know, people will buy into it if you tell them that the gods forged individual kinds of souls, you know, bronze, silver, and gold, and um, you will be raised accordingly. Um, and of course, uh, someone like Karl Popper later on, you know, wrote about how we philosophers should, um, take a step back in, in terms of our um, idealization of Plato because he was a fascist. And um, it's no surprise that with Calicott saying Leopold's doing something similar, he's saying that the holes embodied by ecosystems uh, can be protected and nurtured by sacrifice of even humans. And so it, it is no wonder that others labeled uh, this interpretation of Leopold as being um, hard to accept because it, it smacks of a kind of fascism. Tom Reagan, when he uh, examined uh, Calicott's work, um, like I mentioned before, says, um, it is uh, an ethic that amounts to environmental fascism. Um, his argument was, look, imagine a case, this is Tom Reagan, where choice must be made either to, destroy, either to destroy, say, a rare wildflower or a human being. The clear choice, according to Reagan's understanding of the land ethic, is to do away with the member of the more plentiful, less contributory species, namely the human being. That is, assuming the rarity of the wildflower contributes more to the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community than does some individual human, the land ethic clearly endorses sacrificing the human in case of mortal conflict. Now, of course, given Reagan's own arguments that moral rights accrue only to sentient individuals, humans and other higher animals, his use of the term ecofascism to denote the implication of Leopold's imputed holism becomes understandable. So Reagan considers the land ethic as leading to a reductio ad absurdum and consequently deems it worthy of rejection. Elliot Sober was similarly a critical. Um, he writes, quote, it's hard to know what to say to someone who would save a mosquito just because it's rare rather than a human being given a choice, um, unquote. Sober suggests that to most folks, the assumptions behind the land ethic are so alien that they preclude its acceptance, right? And so if you do read Leopold as someone who wants to appeal to ideas that would be acceptable to philosophers and religionists, then Sober's critique here is, is rather, 
devastating. He's he's saying essentially that it's it's just um, unpalatable. Okay. Now, obviously, the fascism charge being levied against Leopold by Reagan and Sober is correct if it's the case that Leopold's land ethic entails an ecological holism exclusionary of other moral concerns. And to be sure, a triangular affair is Calicut's argument for such exclusivity. In contrast, my assessment of Leopold that I provide later entails that land holism is not to be invariably privileged over other moral concerns because Leopold applies a number of values to both individuals and groups. And he touts a consistency maximization of those values in their, world, in their real world realization. That is to say, Leopold's writings evidencing as they do a respect for values that I argue include utility, virtue, and even moral agency also demonstrate a concern that actions taken on behalf of these values do not come at each other's expense, or if they do, that a reconciliation of these values should be forthcoming. Um, consequently, Reagan's and Sober's indictment of the land ethic as being fascistic is wrongheaded, as is Calicott's early interpretation of Leopold, which supports such a skewed hierarchical view. To preview my own take on Leopold's moral views, consider an earlier statement by Leopold um, about true conservation, uh, one that I believe is still operative in a Sand County Almanac. This was written, um, this statement about conservation in 1939, um, roughly, yeah, nine years earlier um, than the land ethic essay. In 39, Leopold writes, quote, when land does well for its owner and the owner does well by his land, when both end up better by reason of their partnership, we have conservation. When one or the other grows poorer, we do not, unquote. Yet the land ethic principle found in the later San County Almanac, again, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community, it's wrong when it tends otherwise. This exists to guide right-minded conservation. It would be quite surprising if Leopold's views morphed into a land ethic that would fascistically shove aside concerns for, say, human well-being, when the well-being of the conservation-minded farmer is clearly a part of Leopold's equation for right-minded conservation. Okay. So for a number of reasons, including uh, sensitive, perhaps sensitivity to the charge of ecofascism, Calicott backs away from his earlier interpretation of Leopold. But the clearest reason for Calicott's revised interpretation relates to his then newer conviction that the conceptual roots of Leopold's land ethic, when looked at closely, are traceable through an ethical tradition that includes the likes of naturalist Charles Darwin and philosopher David Hume. As will be seen, situating the land ethic within this tradition can have very different consequences from drawing parallels between the land ethic and the moral and political thoughts of Plato. So Calicott's later essay, uh, The Conceptual Foundations of the Land Ethic, um, argues that, uh, as I put it before, several pregnant statements by Leopold um, evidence the Darwinian influence in Leopold's thought. For example, Leopold claims that extending ethics to previously excluded entities and activities is part of ecological evolution. Calicott thinks that the key thing to be taken away from this claim is that ethics can be discussed in biological terms. Furthermore, Leopold states that an ethic is a limitation on freedom of action and the struggle for existence. This last assertion, argues Calicott, unmistakably calls to mind Darwinian evolution as the conceptual context in which a biological account of the origin and development of ethics must ultimately be located. So, because Leopold seems to define ethics in their extension naturalistically, and because um, Leopold uses language hearkening to evolutionary theory, his moral thinking must be substantially Darwinian.
Kellicott then prods his readers down a path that leads back to an ethical tradition, which while not explicitly endorsed by Leopold, influenced Darwin and thus should be recognized as a land ethics theoretical framework or so argues Kellicott. Explaining how Darwin sought after an account of ethics complementary to his revolutionary bio biological views, uh, Kellicott argues that Darwin embraced the work of the moral sense theorists, Human Smith, for example, those who argue that ethics are the product of sentiments or feelings. Indeed, unlike so many philosophers before, philosophers before who argued that ethics are derivable from reason, the moral sense theorists proposed a lesser role for reason, namely, and this is Calicott's understanding of the moral sense theorists, um, they proposed a lesser role for reason as amplifier and informer of sentiments. And that's a different understanding of definitely Hume than most people privilege. Um, Hume, of course, thought that reason was a slave to the passions, not an informer. At least that seems to be Hume's con considered view. Um, so taking cues from the moral sense theorists, Darwin surmises that morality has its origins and, per uh, I'm sorry, that morality has its origins in parental and filial affections with such feelings allowing for the formation of close-knit social groups amongst kin. These feelings might then attach themselves to extended family, enlarging the social group. But if such enlargement betters the life prospects of its members, for, exa uh, for example, through better defense or better provisioning, this might increase the probability of passing down genes that incline such pro-social behaviors. Um, Calicott uh, thus writes, um, the more diffuse familial affections, which Darwin echoing Hume and Smith calls the social sentiments, um, would be spread through uh, throughout a population, unquote. So Calicott goes on to suggest, rather than what he argued in his earlier essay, that Leopold, um, as a natural historian, uh, was made heir to this proto-sociobiological proto perspective on ethical phenomena. Indeed, Calicott tries to further demonstrate the Darwinian nature of Leopold's thought by stringing together two separate quotations from Leopold that hearken to the natural evolution of ethics. And this is Leopold writing, quote, since the thing, ethics, has its origin in the tendency of interdependent individuals or groups to evolve modes of cooperation, all ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise, that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. By the way, that quotation um, is cut off. Uh, remember my highlighting um, that same quotation earlier where politics and economics are given um, ethical content by Leopold. Okay. Um, and Calicott sort of dot, dot, dots it, I believe. Um, he doesn't uh, give the entire quotation. So these mesh uh, quotations punctuate, Calicott maintains, Leopold's Darwinian-inspired conviction that ethics are correlative with community. In fact, if Leopold following Darwin is correct about this connection between ethics and community, then Calicott thinks it serves as an analytical tool, not only for understanding the natural history of morality, but for identifying how morality will progress in the future with all its attending precepts, prescriptions, and proscriptions in tow. Of course, it's based upon this naturalistic interpretation of moral history's past, present, and future from which Calicott thinks Leopold derives his land ethic. So it's almost in good old fashioned, um, style that Calicott is saying something like moral progress is able to be predicted, right? Maybe there's an inevitability in it. The more we realize what we have in terms of kinship to other beings, 
and how communities are made up of these beings, we are going to start to identify with those communities. Um, but the reason it's, it's not gonna amount to fascism is because we wanna privilege those individuals that we're most closely genetically related to. So a land ethic will exist on the periphery, right? Um, of our moral concerns. But sometimes, um, you know, as with uh, people going off and sacrificing themselves or, or at least putting themselves in danger for their country, um, there can be a reversal of priorities. Um, yeah, I love mom and dad, my brothers and sisters, but um, to save them and to save, you know, the, the, the country of which I'm a part, I am going to put myself in danger. So that's why, similarly, um, people will be environmentally minded, even when it costs the well-being of their fellow humans. Um, but it's not inevitable. And so not inevitably fascistic. Um, yeah. All right. Let me stop there. Um, as I said, uh, I wanted to put forward more of my positive account by uh, arguing for those propositions that I spoke about at the beginning. But um, my initial invitation um, to present uh, today was to go over my criticisms of Calicut. And I think I've done a good bit of that. Um, there's more to say, but uh, perhaps stuff can come out during the Q&A. So um, thank you for your attention. And um, I'm welcome, I welcome answering any questions you have.